Here we go. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Sean Smith. I'm a partner with Cleveland Doan and a strata property lawyer, which means that all I do day in and uh, day out is deal with strata corporations and the various issues that they face. And this afternoon, I'm going to take some time and talk to you about uh, bylaw enforcement. Uh, which I think has been a topic on a lot of people's minds as of late. I know a number of the strata corporations that I deal with have seen an increase in bylaw complaints uh, during the COVID period. Um, presumably everyone's home a lot more and a lot more on each other's nerves. Uh, so it may be apropos that we're going through this discussion. Uh, I'm going to uh, go through the presentation and then at the end, we're gonna leave some time for a question and answer. And uh, Wendy, I believe people are going to uh, put those in the chat box uh, and then uh, you'll share them that way. We have a Q&A box. So if we can keep Excellent. the questions to the Q&A box, that's really helpful. Okay. Then without further ado, off we go. Uh, so a bit about uh, who we are, I've already told you a bit about that. Um, we are a full service law firm, there's a total of six lawyers at our firm, and a number of us deal with strata issues, and we deal with everything from collections to bylaws, bylaw enforcement, governance, and providing strategic advice on uh, major issues uh, that are facing uh, the stratas. Bylaw enforcement is probably one of the least pleasant jobs uh, of a strata council. Uh, they have many tasks they have to carry out. This I know for a lot of them is not a pleasant job because you are sitting in judgment over your neighbors uh, and it's awkward. Uh, however, it's often one of the most important jobs because it goes right to the heart of the harmony of the community and the ability of owners to live together uh, in harmony. And it is one in which both process and optics are important. Uh, so when I talk about process, that means following the act, the legal requirements, we're gonna talk a lot about that today, and also optics. Uh, at the end of the day, what actions the council takes, how they take them or what decisions they make may end up being reviewed by an adjudicator at the CRT or by a judge at the BC Supreme Court. And how you go about it is often as important um, as, uh, as ticking all the boxes under the act. Um, at times, navigating bylaw complaints can be like navigating a minefield. Uh, you're often between uh, two owners, uh, one of which who is complaining about something that's being done and another who's adamantly saying, I'm not doing it. Uh, the council is stuck having to navigate that and that can be a very tricky situation Hopefully at the end of the day, you're gonna have a better sense how to do that uh, and some tips to employ. I'm gonna start off a bit with bylaw basics. So in order to uh, enforce the bylaws, you need to have bylaws that are compliant with the act. Uh, so all strata corporations must have bylaws, section 119 of the act. And if you're not sure what your bylaws are, section 120 of the strata property act addresses that. All strata corporations have the standard bylaws, which are found at the end of the act, except to the extent that different bylaws are filed in the land title office. So you can find out what you have filed by doing a general index search. That'll show you what, what's there. If you don't have any bylaws that are filed, then you have the standard bylaws. Bylaws can be amended, both the standard bylaws and any bylaws that you have registered in the land title office. Those amendments take place by way of a three-quarter vote under section 128. And one key thing is that they have to be registered in the land title office in order to be enforceable. So the fact that you passed a bylaw doesn't really mean a heck of a lot. Until it's registered, it can't be enforced. Uh, one thing I didn't note on the slide, but just uh, to make mention of, is if you happen to be in a strata corporation that has both residential and non-residential or commercial strata lots, section 128, one sub C of the act requires those bylaws to be passed by way of a three quarter vote of the residential and a three quarter vote of the commercial strata lot. Uh, 
and there's a case by the name of Omnicare, if you want to look, look that up, that talks about uh, the mechanics of doing that. Uh, but that's something to watch when you're passing bylaws, because again, if they're not enforceable, or if they haven't complied with the act, they're not enforceable, and much of what we, everything we're going to talk about today will be moot. So one of the things when it comes to bylaws is talking about the duty to enforce. And this is the, the foundational uh, aspect of enforcement. So section 26 of the act uh, ref refers to the duties, the council must exercise the powers and perform the duties of the strata corporation. And one of the specific things that is mentioned there is the enforcement of bylaws and rules. So out of all the things that the legislature could have made reference to, because there are many duties that a strata corporation has, uh, the legislature pulled out enforcement of bylaws and the rules, which means that that's obviously quite an important uh, aspect, or at least in the legislature's mind. That duty was confirmed uh, quite early on in 2002 in the McGowan case, where the court said, should a complaint be made, the council must undertake its duty to enforce the bylaws in accordance with the legislation. So we're gonna look at me in a minute, uh, just about what does that really mean? So great, we have a duty to enforce, what does that mean? So when we talk about the duty to enforce, owners have a reasonable expectation that the bylaws will be first of all enforced, that they will be enforced consistently, and that they will be enforced in a manner that is not significantly unfair to either party. And so when we use the term significantly unfair, that's in reference to section 164 of the act. And there is a, there's case law that fleshes out what significant unfairness uh, means uh, legally. We don't have time to get into that today, but essentially it's an oppression remedy. So uh, an action is significantly unfair if it's uh, unjust or oppressive or burdensome or harshful or wrong. Now, the fact that owners have a reasonable expectation that the bylaws will be enforced doesn't mean that there has to be enforced all the time. There is a limited discretion not to enforce bylaws. So back in 2013, the Court of Appeal in the Abdo decision said the strata is not obliged uh, to enforce bylaws merely for the sake of doing so. Uh, so simply because someone broke a rule doesn't mean that we're going to uh, throw the book at them. There has to be some sort of practical uh, aspect or practical purpose for doing so. Uh, in the Curtin decision, the uh, Civil Resolution Tribunal has said that if the effect of the breach is unimportant or trivial to the strata owners in general, it is reasonable for the strata not to enforce it. Now you have to be very careful applying that because whether something is unimportant or trivial really needs to be looked at in an objective uh, perspective, not, uh, not just in the view of one council member uh, or even of the whole council. You have to step back and say objectively to the ownership as a whole, is, is this important to enforce this bylaw? Um, or are we, is it just a trivial breach that we can overlook? And now, Lots of councils don't like bylaw enforcement, so don't latch onto this and take this as you're out to, to avoid it, because I think it's something that needs to be exercised uh, very sparingly and don't stretch it too, too far. But there is one um, decision that uh, dealt with a parking issue, and in that case, uh, an owner had parked once wrongly in the visitor's parking, the strata, uh, decided not to find him and an owner took him to the CRT over it because that owner wanted the rule enforced. And the CRT in that decision said, well, you know, there's really no nothing to enforce. They did it once and they haven't done it since. Uh, so that's sort of an example as to the type of situation where councils can not enforce uh, the bylaws. Uh, ABDO, uh, as an example, going a bit further, was an alteration that was done in the underground parking garage on some limited common property. Didn't affect anyone, didn't affect anything, didn't cause a danger. And the court there said, well, look, there's no, you know, you don't need to enforce it just for the sake of enforcing it. Now, as I said, don't take that discretion not to enforce too, too far, because the CRT has also said that Strata Corporation doesn't 
uh, have the ability to refuse to address a complaint uh, simply because it's an issue between two owners. So I've encountered that quite a lot over the years. Uh, councils who are reluctant to enforce bylaws say, oh, well, it's between the two owners. And that may be true in terms of what's going on. But again, because there is a duty to enforce under Section 26, because the action that's being complained of is a breach of the bylaws, the council has to enforce it. It can't merely back out. Uh, and if you ignore bylaw complaints and don't enforce them, that can have um, financial consequences. So in the Latexier decision, the CRT essentially fined the Strata Corporation $1,000 for not enforcing the bylaws. Now it did so under section 164, finding that it was significantly unfair that the Strata didn't and came up with a monetary penalty. But that's the risk that councils run from a practical standpoint if they don't enforce uh, the bylaws. One thing I often run into is whether or not councils have the ability to grant permanent exemptions from the bylaws. And the answer to that is no, uh, except in two circumstances. So if the bylaw itself allows the council to grant an exemption. So I've seen a number of bylaws that talk about um, except with the permission you can't have a pet or except with the permission of the council you can't do X, Y, or Z. If the bylaw reads that way, then the bylaw allows for the exception. The other is to accommodate under the Human Rights Code. A uh, decision to exempt a bylaw has to be one made by the Strata Council, not an individual member. So I often come across a situation where the Strata Council president is trapped in the underground parking garage by the aggressive realtor who arm twists them into saying it's okay for the buyer to have a dog. Uh, that's not a situation where a proper exemption has been granted. Timely enforcement is also important. Uh, so a delay in enforcing the bylaws can have some negative consequences, one of which is could potentially lead to the inability to enforce the bylaw. So what a law is called the doctrine of acqu acquiescence, or estoppel. Um, the, the Carter decision dealt with that way back in 1991 with respect to a rental bylaw that the Strata Council of the day decided not to enforce. New Council came along a year later, tried to enforce it, and the court said, no, you can't do it because you let him rent his Strata lot uh, for over a year and didn't do anything. Bylaws unenforceable. It can also create problems with the limitation period. So in Nicholson, the Strata Corporation came along uh, almost three years after an owner altered the common property and tried to enforce uh, the alteration bylaw. And the CRT said in that case, sorry, Strata, you're too late. The two-year limitation has passed and your statute barred from dealing with it. You can also run into problems with collecting fines. Not so much the fines themselves because the fines aren't subject to the limitation period, but in law has the CRT held that this Strata Corporation took too long to get to the CRT and was fining the owner during that interval and therefore the fines that were imposed past what the CRT felt would have been a reasonable time to bring the claim forward were not enforceable. Um, so the CRT has said you can't dally. Uh, you can give a reasonable amount of time uh, for an owner to come into compliance, but at some point you need to take action. Now, the law is a complicated and wonderful thing because there is also a case by the name of Chan from 2010, where the BC Supreme Court said a statutory duty to enforce bylaws uh, can sometimes save the day. In other words, estoppel or acquiescence is not applied. All of these situations are fact dependent, uh, but if you dallied, it's not necessarily that, that it's all sunk. Uh, you may be able to save yourself based on the Chan decision. Inconsistent enforcement is equally problematic. Uh, it can lead to a bylaw being unenforceable in a particular instance or the bylaw as a whole. Uh, I've cited a couple decisions, uh, the CRT decision in Bruce, there the strata uh, applied uh, 
a bylaw with respect to pets against the Bruces, but it had not applied it against other owners, and the CRT held that it could not be applied against the Bruces because of that. The Elks decision is from Alberta. It was an interesting decision. The Strata had a satellite dish bylaw uh, that regulated sizes, locations, uh, etc. And it was applied all over the board, uh, seemingly on who was on the council's uh, good, good graces and who was not. At the end of the day, the court there threw the bylaw out entirely because it simply hadn't been enforced in a manner that allowed it to be enforced going forward. Uh, so take away from those last two slides, uh, be proactive, don't delay in enforcement, and try and be consistent in enforcement, uh, both during your term as a strata council and with what respect to what other strata councils did in the past. So now that you know as a strata council that you have a duty to enforce the bylaws, question arises, how are you going to do that? Uh, what are your options? So the, the primary methods for enforcing bylaws are imposing fines against the offending tenant or owner. We're going to talk about that in a couple minutes when, when we get to fines, because you may be surprised to see if you can find the tenant or the owner. Uh, the other is remedying a contravention uh, under Section 133 of the SBA, or sometimes even individual bylaws uh, have a provision for dealing with, uh, with contraventions, i.e. if you had a bylaw that allowed towing a vehicle. And then the third most common is seeking an order that the owner comply with the bylaws. Those aren't the only methods available. Uh, some other less common methods are Section 134 of the Act allows a strata corporation to deny access to a recreational facility, but the breach has to be in relation to the use of the facility. So for example, you can't say, oh, you didn't pay your strata fees or your dog barks a lot, so you can't use the swimming pool. Uh, but if someone broke a rule or a bylaw with respect to the swimming pool, the gym, the common room, then the strata can, for a reasonable period of time, uh, suspend their use of that facility. Another option set out in the Act is Section 138, deals with evicting a tenant for a repeated or continual breach uh, of a bylaw which seriously interferes with someone else's use and enjoyment of their strata lot. So that's an ability for uh, the strata corporation to serve a notice to end tenancy. Uh, it's not easily enforced, uh, but it's an option. In my paper, I talk a bit more about it. Um, so if you want to know a bit more about that option, feel free to read. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it today. The other is to provide a warning. Section 129 specifically uh, references providing a warning. Uh, so again, much like uh, there's discretion not to enforce a bylaw, there's discretion with the how, how to approach enforcing a bylaw. So sometimes just giving someone a warning, they may not have been aware that what they were doing was a breach of the bylaws. Bring it to their attention, uh, try and talk it out, work it out. At the end of the day, you all live in community and that needs to be kept in mind. Standard bylaw 29, uh, envisions a voluntary dispute resolution committee comprised of various owners within the strata to try and breach uh, the, the gap between uh, two sets of owners that are having an issue or the owners uh, and the strata corporation. So again, it, it's a method that could be employed if owners want to try and talk it out themselves as opposed to uh, going through the formal enforcement process. We'll start now to look at some of the options available uh, in some detail. So first of all is fines and who can you find? And this is really important because you could end up losing the ability to collect your fines if it's not done right. And this is part of what I talked about earlier about process. So section 130 of the Strata Property Act says the strata can find an owner if the owner, a person visiting the owner, or an occupant of their strata lot contravenes a bylaw or a rule. 
you'll notice there there's no mention of tenant. That's because tenant is mentioned in the next subsection. So you can find a tenant if the tenant or a person visiting them or someone occupying the strata lot they're renting contravenes the bylaw. And lots of stratas I've seen over the years make this mistake. The tenants, the one breaching the bylaws, they're writing to and fining the owner. That's not what the act requires or envisions. That same requirement is reflected in section 135, which is what we're gonna to get to at the end of the, pr the presentation. But if you're not finding the right person, then you're not gonna be able, the CRT is gonna dismiss those fines and you're gonna be out that money. Now, you may be scratching your head and saying, well, if we find the owner, how do we collect? Well, there are methods of collecting, but ultimately section 131 says the buck stops with, with the owner. If you find the tenant, the tenant leaves, the owner is gonna be left being liable for any fines assessed against the tenant. Uh, and I know that's often a concern that Strata share. Well, if we find the tenant, we're never collect them from the owner. Rest assured, the act provides you with that ability. So what amount can you find? The standard bylaws start with $50 for each breach of a bylaw and $10 for each breach of a rule. Not much money not much of a deterrent. That amount can be increased by way of a bylaw amendment. However, you can't just pick whatever amount you want. The Act sets some limits on that. Regulation 7.1 says the maximum amount of bylaw fines is $200, $500 for rental bylaw, $1,000 for travel accommodation, and $50 for a rule. So if you're still on the old standard bylaw amounts, you may want to consider increasing those amounts so that you've got a greater deterrent with respect to, uh, the, to the bylaws and a greater consequence if someone breaches them. The other concept is when we talk about fines is continuing contraventions and repeated contraventions. And this ties into standard bylaw 24. Pretty much every strata has it, maybe in, in a slightly different, different numbering or format. But it says that the strata can fine an owner or a tenant every seven days for a continuing breach of a bylaw. Well, what's a continuing breach? So it's a single contravention which carries on without interruption. So examples are renting a strata lot contrary to a rental prohibition or restriction bylaw. Uh, having a pet when you're not supposed to have one, or having done an alteration when you didn't get permission. All of those things have a distinct start, and they carry on without a distinct end. Uh, absent bylaw 24, you'd only be able to issue one fine. Again, not much of a deterrent. With bylaw 24, you could issue a fine every seven days for someone who's renting their strata lot, contrary to the bylaws. Contrast that with a repeated contravention. So that's a series of events which are identical in nature, but which each have a clear start and finish. So examples are noise complaints and smoking. They may happen every day, but there's a discrete start and stop. Uh, someone may make noise from 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. and the next day from 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. Those are discrete events and a fine can be issued for each in individual event. In my paper, I, met, I talk a little bit about the Grabarsic decision. That's a perfect example of where this comes in, into play. In that case, the owner uh, made all sorts of strange noise at all hours of the day, washed dishes in, in uh, the bathtub, um, a variety of very strange activities, uh, drove her neighbors crazy. The strata fined her $200 every week because this went on every day. The court threw out most of those fines because they weren't continuing contraventions, they were repeated contraventions and they should have been fined for each individual incident. This also becomes important when we get into section 135 and we talk about uh, giving notice and the particulars of the contravention. Our second most common option is section 133 of the act, and that allows a strata corporation to do 
what is reasonably necessary to remedy a contravention of the bylaws or the rules. And then the section suggests a couple things, doing work, removing objects. It also permits the strata to require the reasonable costs of that remedying that contravention to be paid by the person who may be fined. So what can section 133 be used for? Well, as I said, it lists two things. That's not the sum total, they're just examples. But common ways I've seen it used in practice, uh, removing unauthorized alterations, cleaning up a strata lot. So if you have a strata lot where someone's been hoarding garbage and uh, has, a, has attracted rodents and pests, you could clean all that out, charge the cost back to that owner. Uh, removing unauthorized items from the common property, uh, repairing damage. So there's one uh, decision by the name of uh, FAM PHAM where the court allowed the Strata Corporation to recover the costs of repairing damage to various strata lots as a result of a marijuana grow operation relying on section 133. It can also be used uh, to tow vehicles and even if it all comes down to that hiring a lawyer. Now, there's a catch to 133. You can incur the costs right away, uh, but they can't be charged to the owner, i.e. put on their account, until there has been compliance with section 135. Uh, and I'm gonna say that again when we talk about 135, about the mechanics of that. But just because you go and incur the cost doesn't mean you can put them to the owner's account right away. You have to hold them in abeyance for a little bit. Unfortunately, you cannot file a lien for costs incurred under Section 1, 133. So you're not secured like you are for strata fees. You can collect those costs on the sale of a strata lot when the owner requests their Form F. Um, but if there was a foreclosure by a bank, the strata may not be able to recover those costs if there's no equity in the property. So that should just be um, caused to pause for a moment and think about how much money the strata is going to commit to in remedying a contravention. Uh, so be cautious. Uh, also uh, think about uh, limits on expenses. The Act only allows the strata to uh, spend so much on unapproved expenditures and emergency expenditures under Section 98 of the Act are limited to situations where it's immediately necessary to prevent significant loss or damage and to the minimum amount necessary to do so, the Band-Aid solution. Um, so be cautious if you're thinking of using Section 133. Uh, one other point to raise, Section 84 of the Act uh, does allow the Strata Corporation to lean for money that it spent complying with a work order issued by a municipality or a government body. So often when we're dealing with a situation where an owner has breached a bylaw uh, by doing an unauthorized alteration or they've uh, hoarded garbage and other debris in, the, in their strata lot. Uh, if we can get a government body to come in and give an order, that's gonna help the strata then, if they have to do that work, collect it uh, as a lienable cost. Handling complaints. Uh, so I wanted to spend just a little bit of time talking about the overall process of how you handle a bylaw complaint. Uh, so the Strata Corporation is going to receive a complaint. So the first thing I recommend is, you, is that the council assess the complaint and ask whether, if what's alleged in it is true, does it contravene a bylaw? So if you were to receive a complaint and somebody said, well, I think my neighbor's patio furniture is really ugly. Um, unless you have a bylaw that says you must have nice looking patio furniture, uh, there's nothing you can do about that. Uh, because it's not everything that someone objects to is a breach of the bylaws. So that's the first thing. The second thing that you're going to ask as a strata council is, uh, does the complaint contain sufficient details, date, time, description, photos to support the allegation? Uh, because when we talk about section 135 and the particulars you have to provide, those are the sort of things you're going to need to put into your letter to the owner. So do you have enough to act on? 
Um, if the answer to one and two is yes, then you're going to send what I refer to as a section 135 letter. You're going to then wait until you get a reply to that letter or a deadline for replies passed before you make any decision with respect to whether there's been a bylaw breach. If the council receives the complaint, it's there, sorry, receives a reply from, from the, uh, the, the accused owner or tenant, it's going to assess that against the complaint and decide whether a breach has occurred or not. I couldn't decide the more evidence is needed or that an investigation is warranted. After that, it's then going to advise the outcome of its decision in writing uh, to both the, the accused owner and sometimes to the owner who brought forward the complaint. If it needs to, then it's going to take steps to achieve compliance. So when you're handling the complaint, as a council, you need to keep a couple things in mind. You need to comply with the principles of procedural fairness and make sure that you're not significantly un acting in a significantly unfair manner to any person who appears before you, either the complaining owner or the accused owner. In other words, don't make up your mind or at least appear to prejudge the matter. Let everyone have their say. As much as process is important, optics are important as well. Occasionally, strata counselors are going to need to dig deeper. One of those occasions is where there's conflicting evidence. So it may require uh, or may have to make further inquiries and attempt to reconcile uh, both the complaint and the response. And so one example of that arises in the Mason decision. In Mason, an owner complained that their neighbor was smoking, didn't provide dates or times or too much that they're smoking. Strata Corporation wrote to uh, Mr. Mason said, we got to complain you're smoking. Mr. Mason wrote back and said, no, nope, I'm not, uh, don't do that. Strata Council looked at it and said, well, we don't believe him, we believe the complainant, we're gonna find, uh, find Mr. Mason. The CRT said, without something essentially to break the tie, the strata had no basis for doing that. Uh, so what it should have done was written back to the complaining owner and said, you need to give us something more. What is perhaps more troubling uh, to strata councils is a growing line of cases in the CRT that impose a duty to investigate uh, allegations of bylaw breaches. So some of those examples uh, are of cases where the CRT has held that the strata should have undertaken an investigation, are complaints with respect to odor coming from another strata lot, secondhand smoke, uh, allegations of noise, including hard surface flooring. There's a number of the hard surface flooring cases where the CRT has held that the strata should have gotten an expert to go inspect the flooring. Um, other cases have said that the strata should have at least uh, you know, sent someone out at the time of the complaint. Uh, if someone's complaining about noise, have them call a strata council member, go at the time and uh, listen to it. Uh, so this is a growing trend I've noticed that councils are being required to be proactively involved in some of these complaints. Um, what that looks like and to what extent is gonna depend on each individual situation, but it's something that if you're on a strata council, you need to start to give thought to how you're going to develop uh, a plan for addressing these particular situations. So you've heard me talk a lot about section 135 and I've kind of been building up to it because it is the, it is the crux of bylaw enforcement in terms of making sure that you can collect your fines because if you can't collect fines, uh, then they haven't been of much utility. And more importantly, if you have spent money to remedy a con bylaw contravention, if you haven't complied with section 135, you're not gonna be able to get that back. And so it is a critically important part of the bylaw enforcement process. Uh, 
So just going back to section 130, or starting off with section 135, and it harkens back to uh, 130 and 133. Section 135 says bef before a fine is imposed or the costs of remedying a contravention, so that's the section 133 reference, are charged to an owner, uh, the strata must comply with section 135. Now that same requirement applies if you're charging it to the tenant as well. The Court of Appeal in the Terry decision says that strict compliance is required. So it's not a question of, well, we tried and we got pretty close or, you, you, you know, we, we only did this one step wrong. Based on the strict compliance, compliance requirement, if you haven't ticked all the boxes and dotted your I's and crossed your T's, you're not going to be able to recover your fines and you're not going to be able to recover your costs of remedying bylaw contravention. And there are countless CRT decisions when you go through them where the CRT has found, yeah, you know, there was a breach, but we're not awarding the fines because the council didn't follow the 133 process. And this is also really important for strata managers because the councils are looking to you to guide them through this process. And if they can't recover the fines, uh, I'm sure they're going to be coming back to you and saying, well, why couldn't we? Um, so it's just a matter of following the steps. Now, what are those steps? So section 135 sets out the steps uh, in the section itself. And we're going to look at each of these uh, as we go forward. But well, first of all, it has to have received a complaint about a contravention. It has to give the owner or tenant the particulars of the complaint in writing. It has to provide a reasonable opportunity to answer the complaint, including a hearing if requested. Give notice of the complaint to the landlord and the owner in case of a breach by a tenant. And then as soon as you, and if you've made a decision, give notice as soon as feasible of that decision. So we'll look first at complaints. Uh, what constitutes a complaint? Uh, so in the Stevens decision, the uh, Provincial Court Small Claims Division said that a complaint does not need to be in writing. It could be an oral complaint. Uh, I always uh, encourage strategists if someone does make, a, make an oral complaint, at least take a note of it, uh, date and time and who, so you've got a record to refer back to. Uh, one question I often get is, can strata council members make complaints? Uh, the Himmelman decision in 2018 uh, said that they could. And then uh, even in Simpson, the CRT said the complaint can be from a strata manager. So it doesn't have to just be an owner who's complaining. Anyone in or around involved with the strata can make that complaint. Now, uh, just before I go on, uh, in the paper, I had made brief mention about uh, Section 35 and 36 of the Strata Property Act that allow owners to request documents. Uh, one of the documents that can be requested are the complaint letters. Uh, the CRT has held that those are not to be redacted. Uh, so if an owner writes in a complaint uh, and the, the accused owner wants to see it, uh, the Strata has to provide that unredacted. So that's something to keep in mind if you're writing in on a complaint. Uh, the other, the owner you're complaining about is going to see that if they want to. When you're giving your written notice to the, uh, the accused owner or tenant, uh, you should indicate the possible imposition of a fine. Uh, so don't say we've imposed a fine or, or we're we've decided to impose a fine, uh, you need to say that something along the lines of the Strata Council is uh, considering imposing a fine or may impose a fine um, because the Act, Section 135 is very clear, you cannot impose a fine. If you use any language that indicates you've imposed a fine, you've run afoul of that first um, provision. You also have to make sure you identify the correct bylaw or rule alleged to have been breached. There's been a couple CRT decision where fines have been thrown out because they're referring to the wrong rules. So uh, back to my original, uh, when we started off talking about the bylaws, make sure you have the right set of bylaws in front of you, up to date set and you're making reference to the right provisions. Uh, you also need then to set up the particulars or details 
sufficient to make the alleged violator aware of what the breach is. Uh, so if it's a noise or smoking complaint, I always recommend you know, date and time and what it was. You know, Tuesday at 9 a.m. to 9.10, um, smoke uh, or noise, uh, singing. The more detail, uh, the better. What those particulars look like are going to vary from uh, situation to situation. Uh, if you're going to allege a breach of something such as a rental restriction bylaw, uh, then your date and time may not be so important, but you're going to have to say why you think someone's in there and renting. You also need to provide a deadline for a response. Uh, that response can either be written or requesting a hearing. So make sure that is in the letter. In the Terry decision, the Court of Appeal said what constitutes a reasonable opportunity to respond must take into account the nature of the alleged contravention. So uh, the more complex the allegations or the more numerous, an owner may need longer to respond. Uh, and if they request an extension, then it would be appropriate to give them that. Generally, owners are given two or three weeks uh, to respond. Unlike other provisions of the Act, such as uh, Section 112 that talks about uh, the steps you need to take before you go to collect monies, uh, which is a very clear 20-day deadline, Section 135 doesn't have a specific deadline. Uh, so other parts of the Act use two weeks. Uh, if you want to follow that Section 112 20-day deadline, um, same deadline for giving notice for a meeting, then three weeks would be acceptable. In your letter, don't appear to have prejudged the matter. And then when you're giving notice, make sure you give it in the same way that you give notice to that owner of a general meeting. So section 61 of the act talks about uh, the ways in which notice must be given. Section 135 is notice under the act, which is why section 61 then applies. So some traps that stratus have fallen into. A failure to clarify the allegations can amount to a failure to provide particulars. So if the owner writes back and says, I'm not sh sure what you're uh, alleging here, what have I done? Uh, the strategy council has an obligation or could, could have an obligation to respond back and clarify those. Now, if the owner is being coy, and that's quite obvious, then you don't, then you don't. Although for the sake of optics, again, you may want to uh, just hold your nose and write back. But if there's a legitimate question to be asked, the council needs to respond to that. Uh, where an owner doesn't respond uh, to the complaint, uh, the CRT said it's reasonable to assume their guilt. So if they're not responding, then they mustn't disagree with it. Uh, nonetheless, I'd still want to make sure before you're going to impose a fine that there's sufficient evidence uh, provided by the complainant to make sure or to back up that allegation. If the owner requests a hearing, you have to grant one, even if it seems absolutely ludicrous. Um, if you know they have a dog and you're not allowed to have a dog and everyone's seen the dog and everyone knows they have a dog, but they still want to have a hearing, you have to give it, it's, it's a right they're entitled to under the act. Uh, there is a bunch of case law with respect to hearings and um, how, uh, how those are to be conducted. So that's something to look at and uh, certainly some reasonable limits can be placed on that, but you can't deny that. So a hearing is a chance to appear in person before the council and argue one's case. Uh, now these days with COVID in person can be electronically, so you can have a Zoom hearing that is sufficient. It's an opportunity to be for the owner to be heard, which means that the strata is not obliged to present their case, bring forward witnesses, or even engage in a dialogue. They're there to hear what the owner has to say uh, and then take that and make a decision. It is important though that the hearing be conducted fairly and not be predetermined. So again, hear them out. Even if you don't think you're gonna agree with what they have to say, let them ha have their say. If you make a decision um, to, to impose a fine, then there's certain things you need to do. Uh, and first of all, the decision to impose a fine must be made by the council. This is the Dimitrov case 
from back in 2006. Uh, in that case, the Strata Council president uh, took on the role of deciding who to find and when and where, and the court said it doesn't work that way. It's a decision that has to be made by the council. Section 135.2, uh, you'll recall from when we originally went through the list of what's in section 135 it says you have to get a notice in writing as soon as feasible uh, so the uh, Tantillo decision down at the bottom of the slide in that case the strata forgot to let them know uh, and therefore the fines were set aside the other thing the CRT has said is that if you're going to impose a fine you should state the reason why um, we found you to be in breach of bylaw x because of y uh, and then the amount of the fine. So are we gonna fine you the maximum 200? Maybe we're only gonna fine you 50, 100, spell that out. That same decision should be reflected in the minutes. So what if you didn't get it right and you suddenly realized you haven't complied with section 135? Well, fear not, a failure to comply can be fixed. So in Chung, which is a Supreme Court decision from 2004, as well as the SM decision from the CRT, uh, both have held that you can simply reverse the fines or the chargebacks under section 133 and then start the process over. Uh, so give the owner that opportunity to have their hearing or to respond. All is not lost. Uh, in the uh, Fortitano decision, the CRT said the strata in that case didn't reverse the fines. They simply held a hearing um, before going any further with bylaw enforcement. The CRT uh, in that particular case found that that was fine. They, they provided their, their opportunity. I'm not sure that that fits with, uh, squarely with the Court of Appeal in Terry. Uh, but it is a decision uh, that's out there. Uh, the extreme end is the 22H Chateau Boulevard series. Uh, there's three cases um, dealing with that particular matter. But in the very first one, the strata uh, charged some uh, repair costs back to an owner, didn't, uh, before granting a hearing, uh, granted them a hearing, but didn't reverse them and then went on to the CRT. The CRT set their claim aside because they didn't comply with section 133, but left the door open for them to go back, do it over and come back again. Uh, so that shows that just how far you can potentially go having not complied. I don't recommend that. One of the things I very clearly look at when we get a file and are asked to collect fines is we go right back and go through the process and say, have you complied with 133? dotted all your I's, crossed all your T's. Better to resolve it then before plunging forward. The ultimate res uh, remedy to resort to are enforcement orders. So as you can see, bylaw enforcement is often uh, an escalation. Uh, it could start with a warning. Uh, often it starts with fines and more fines and further fines. And then simply if nothing is happening, then the strata corporation is left, the only choice they're left with is to seek an order that the owner comply with the bylaws. The Civil Resolution Tribunal is now the venue in which that occurs. Under Section 123 of the Civil Resolution Tribunal Act, so that's the act that sets, governs how the CRT works, uh, in relation to strata property claims, it can order a party to do something refrain from doing something or pay money. So that's the basis for the for the, the CRT to order an owner to get rid of that dog, remove that alteration, stop smoking, stop making noise, whatever the issue may be. The one thing the CRT cannot do is grant general restraining orders. So it won't grant an order uh, that an owner uh, stop uh, just generally being, being a bother. Um, that is as held as outside of it, its purview. Even then, uh, you'd be unlikely to get such a broad order uh, in the Supreme Court. The CRT will not grant orders to comply generally with the bylaws. That's an obligation owners have under the Act already. So uh, it's too general of an order. So ask for specific things. If you're at the CRT, ask for an order that the owner stop smoking 
or they stop making noise after 10 p.m., or the order that they remove their hot tub, or the order that they keep their dog on a leash. Uh, whatever the activity is that is breaching the bylaw, that's what the order should address. And I think you can be creative. So in uh, the LMS XXX decision uh, and DB, the CRT uh, made an order restricted to who could visit the strata lot. Um, you certainly, you have to have a good basis for the CRT to make that sort of order, but that was a decision that shows uh, just how creative the process can be. So how do you go about getting an enforcement order? Well, the council can make the decision to go to the CRT. Prior to the CRT, if you needed to go to Supreme Court to enforce the bylaw, that had to go to the owners for a three-quarter vote. That doesn't need to occur now. The council can do that. Uh, the Strata Corporation can have a lawyer assist. So it's not something the council has to do on their own. The starting position with the CRT is the parties must represent themselves, but they can apply to have a representative appointed. Uh, so lawyers either help in the background by preparing the claim, helping assemble evidence, uh, writing up the written argument, uh, or we are sometimes appointed as a representative. Uh, that occurs more and more often now where the cases are complex. Legal fee recovery, though, is an issue. Um, the CRT uh, has held that it will not order legal fee recovery under Section 133, uh, but if the Strata Corporation has a bylaw that allows it to recover the legal fees of going to the CRT, then they can get their money back. So that's a bylaw I think that all Strata Corporations should have in place. The CRT decision is binding and enforceable and the principle of res judicata can apply. So res judicata is a legal principle that says the matter's already been decided, you can't bring it back a second time uh, to take another, another run at it. And that can cut both ways. So if the strat has gone to the CRT for an enforcement order and that claim has been dismissed uh, and the CRT says, well, there isn't a breach, then the strata might be prevented from coming back another time uh, on the same set of, uh, set of circumstances uh, to, uh, to seek a different order. Uh, so that ties in again to making sure that you get the right advice to help with, with that claim. If you're going to the CRT for fines or costs under Section 133, remember to comply with Section 112 of the Act that requires the Strata Corporation to give 20 days notice uh, of its intention to go ahead and uh, claim money through a legal process. An order made by the CRT can be registered in the BC Supreme Court and enforced as if it were an order of that court. So quite often I get, I, I hear people say, well, it's just a CRT order, what are we gonna do with it? Um, that's what you're gonna do with it. It is an enforceable order. You simply have to be prepared to do that. Um, because it once registered, it becomes an order of the Supreme Court, uh, then it is enforceable uh, through the Supreme Court's contempt proceedings. Uh, generally, the remedy for contempt is that someone be jailed or fined. Uh, it can also, uh, the court can also give the strata the ability to do something, remove that alteration that was supposed to be removed. The ultimate remedy, though, is that the court can order the strata lot to be sold, is what happened in the B decision. But as noted uh, in the U decision, uh, the bottom uh, bullet point, it is a remedy of last resort. The court is not going to do that uh, easily. So you have to build your case carefully if you're going to go and ask for that remedy. Unfortunately, the CRT can't order an owner uh, to, to move and sell. It's not within their jurisdiction. And that uh, brings us then to the end of the presentation and Wendy, I guess we'll do uh, our Q&A now. Thank you so much for coming. We're gonna stop the recording and go into our Q&A.